Isn't the point of traveling to get away from it all, to feel the best you've ever felt? Then maybe you should check out Aruba. You'll spend your time relaxing on cool white sandy beaches and floating in healing blue water. You'll meet locals brimming with gratitude for an island that redefines what a paradise can be. When your trip comes to an end, you won't need another vacation because you just had the vacation. That's the Aruba effect. Plan your trip at aruba.com. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Um, Mark Livesey is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. All right, so I'm sitting here, and I am talking to David Alexander. And uh, David, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself for everybody out there? Yeah, sure. Well, first, appreciate being invited on. Enjoy the podcast, so it's nice to be a guest. Uh, it's kind of a hard question to answer because um, you know it depends what the season is. <laughs> uh, but I, I work as a I work as a naturalist, as a conservation biologist uh, for a park system. So I'm out there every day um, doing park management native plant management, deer management, but also a big part of the big part of all that is uh, environmental education for kids. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm really just passionate about getting outside about nature. So I consider myself first and foremost, a nature enthusiast. So I'm out there every chance I can, whether it's foraging, fishing, hunting. So let's talk about, I kind of want to get into this right away because it's, it's pretty cool. And I always love having a naturalist on versus just a hunter or something like that. Somebody who's got uh, more of a diverse background into the, you know, biology and everything that goes along with a lot of the plants and animals and things like that. It's always cool to talk to them and kind of get their insight. And to be honest, I think you may be one of the only uh, naturalists that actually hunts as well, which is pretty cool. Um, so kind of tell me how all that went and was it, uh, from an early child or what? I wish I, you know, I knew from early on, I was, I was interested in it all, but I grew up in a suburb and, uh, you know, it was just, just a formal, formal suburb. You went to school, played a lot of sports. Uh, so it really wasn't until I got my driver's license that I kind of had my own individual opportunity to go out and do what I wanted to do. Um, so, so went off, went off to, uh, Went off to yeah I know I'm like an I'm like an adult onset hunter um, so it was it was you know going to college learning about uh, environmental science and conservation biology and um, going to, going to work and just slowly picking up skills I, you know I honestly have a lot of a uh, lot to thank uh, for from YouTube you know YouTube really is, is my my mentor I didn't grow up grow up hunting and fishing and foraging you know so, um, you know there I, there were some books here and there but you know it wasn't visual. Yeah. No, I, I just saw a quote the other day that Elon Musk was saying something about you can, uh, you know, master any talent within eight months, watch it all on YouTube, learn it, never pay for an education, all these different things. And he's like, only in this age. So uh, why not go against it, but embrace it? And, I mean, it's true. There's so many things out there. And just to think like when I was a kid or the things that I would have to do to learn and, and trying to read, you know, certain magazines and a lot of articles are way more hyped up about certain things than they actually are. And, you know, you're not getting the factual stuff and you can almost filter through. There's so much content now you can filter through all that and, and actually sift through and find the, you know, the good nuggets in there of information and knowledge versus uh, trying to sift through a bunch of magazine articles that are pretty much written to sell products, you know? <laughs> right. And bring it local. You know, there's a major difference between hunting in, in the New Jersey woods where I live, hunting in the Adirondack woods where I go go taking uh, camping trips and, and everywhere else everything's everything's different um if you're if you're in hunting next to a cornfield in the midwest you shoot a big buck 
you know, maybe maybe it's all relative, but you do that up in the Adirondacks where there's less than one per square mile. Uh, you know, that's a diff- different way to look at these accomplishments and these skills. You know, I find that Literally. interesting, even though there is like a population density of, you know, 10 deer per square mile or 20 deer per square mile in Illinois, the, the concentration of them in certain areas, public areas and other public areas not being existent pretty much being driven out by other hunters and stuff. I find it kind of fascinating that people will want to flock to Illinois, even though in some of your Northern portions of the properties, there's not a whole lot of deer in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So some, sometimes, you know, I like, like you're, you're publicly challenged. Uh, you know, I like that the challenge is the opportunity. You know, a lot of times that's where the enjoyment comes in, trying to, trying to put all the pieces together that you need to get, get complete a goal. Absolutely. So. um you grew up as a kid. I don't know was if this was you or not, but you know, oh look, a deer! Like it was a rare sighting type thing. Was that like no. your childhood experiences, I, or? Oh, not not at all. Where I live locally, we have high deer abundance. Um, so so I live I live in New Jersey. There's there's um, too many deer. I work in the same county that I grew up in, and we even have a deer management program where, uh, since it's uh, too populated to allow legal hunting like you know fish and wildlife based permit based hunting in there we have um we have a group of guys who come in who are you know have to go through a sharp shooting test and uh they're using they're using shotguns with rifle barrels which is what's legal in new jersey instead of rifles and um so so we actually have deer management programs to try to reduce the herd that's how many deer we have because they're just decimating the the forest of the native plant species that are you know beneficial to so many other um so many other animals that reminds so, me of so, <laughs> the guy the, the guy that was the urban hunter that has the special permit like in DC or something and I think he shoots like 90 deer a year or something like that in a in an urban environment and he was talking about how he even hunts from like playhouses and stuff in people's backyards yeah. <laughs> yeah yes yeah we do yeah baited you know a lot of baited stations in in New Jersey you can bait with corn whatever you you know whatever you like um, so, so it's easy to take does, you know, bucks, you know, is another challenge, but, uh, it's definitely, it's, um, opportunity deer management. We have a long season. It's almost six months long. So there's plenty of opportunity to harvest deer. Uh, it's, uh, November now I've taken three, three deer. Nice. And, uh, and then I have took one as a depredation permit just to help, a, help an organic farmer, uh, to get, get one off her farm. Um, so for, for, so there's plenty of opportunity. I know guys can come down, come to New Jersey just to fill their freezers, and then they can enjoy the hunt somewhere else. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, if you can take that many deer. I know here, like here in Illinois, you can only take two bucks, but you can take pretty much unlimited does. I think it used to be like a limit of six or something, but now, I mean, it's it's unlimited. You can just keep going back and buying tags. Not that you need to. I mean, after a certain point, it's kind of pointless, but um, it's pretty neat that, you know, guys will come to New Jersey from other places to do that. But I, I'm kind of curious as far as like, how did, how did the hunting aspect start then? Was it something that just kind of intrigued you after watching the animals and being there and studying them or what was the, I, you know, I, I always knew I was interested in it. I, I took, uh, I took my hunter safety when I was 21. I took it in person, uh, in a room full of kids with, you know, with their parents <laughs> sitting behind them. And, um, you know, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I had a great instructor. I remember his name was Randy. It was up in Vermont. Uh, so, so it was a good class and I, you know, but even, so even taking hunter, hunter safety, you still, it's still, you still then got to go find your public access. Where are you going to hunt? You got to choose what are you going to hunt with? You got to figure out the, the, the digest with all the different permit seasons. You know, I remember getting a climber and first time I used my climber, I probably only went like five, six feet up. So <laughs> That, which, you know, there's, there's which a lot. Killable. It's killable, yeah, you yeah, know. True. Um, I true, mean, there's a lot of guys that do that. In fact, my buddy just killed a really, really nice whitetail, and uh, had the honor of helping him drag it out. Which I thought I actually might have had a heart attack at the moment carrying it up a or dragging it up a incline. But um, he he was like eight feet off the ground, and uh, he got a beast, a beast of a buck. Nice. Yeah. I see you guys doing the saddle hunting. I'm, 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 I'd like to start learning more about that. I see you have a couple podcasts on it. Yeah. Um, but 
still still just enjoying my climber just you know it's you know, just have a summit climber nice to just wander out and pick a tree and um so when i first started i i you know i found public land finally you know the internet had some good maps available you know you go suss it out you go check it out um you pick a spot but if you don't see deer with a climber you go pick another spot and eventually you start to figure out where the deer are moving and key, key in better on sign and funnels and so it's just definitely a slow progression. I, I didn't actually start hunting till I think 29, and I'm I'm 38 now. So, <laughs> so it's you know that that progression is, has been has been a big part of the fun. Well, no, I think that's really cool though that you you took that step and it was a conscious effort. It wasn't like you were, you know, a lot of people are born into it and don't even realize the mentorship and everything they have. But when somebody, and I've said this before, when somebody actually makes that conscious effort and and makes up their mind that they're going to hunt and they start doing that they're going to progress faster than somebody that has the mentors because they're driven by something different it's internal it's from the self now i'm not saying mentors can't help you along the way because they greatly impact how you hunt and 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 the knowledge that you gain but but when you're seeking that out yourself it's a little bit different um it, it definitely shows drive and it shows the the courage to go out and do these things, which, which speaks volumes about a person, right? And and what I think is pretty cool, though, is like some of the adventures. And, and it was actually somebody else that turned me on to following you. And they said, no, there's this guy and he lives like in Jersey, but he goes up into the mountains or somewhere and he, he goes into big woods and hikes in and puts up a wall tent and stays there for, you know, days on end or two weeks at a time and lives out of it and catches. And, and so I started looking into it and I was like, that's pretty cool, man. This guy's got some cool adventures, snowshoeing in and all that kind of stuff. So what, what inspired you to do that? Uh, You know, sometimes the distance away from these, these places is, is a benefit. Uh, You know, if you live there, you, you go out for the day and you come back in and you warm up and, you know, in your home, but because I'm, a distance away from well the Adirondack Park, which is my favorite place to go. I'm a five hour drive, so uh, um, so you end up setting up a camping trip. So you know it starts in the in the autumn. My first trip, I did a canoe camping trip, found brook trout. Uh, you know, fished hard trying to catch brook trout. That was that was probably one of the one of the big first camping trips of mine, and uh, you know just was clueless. You know, I wasn't letting my I wasn't letting my uh, my lure drop down. I went through a container of worms. Um, you know, finally go through a few ponds, make it to one pond. I'm out of worms. I flip a log. I find a redback salamander. I put that on my, my, uh, you know, my MEPS or whatever I was using, cast it next to a log and I catch a brookie, you know, and it's, in it's full autumn regalia and it's spawning colors. And, uh, you know, that, that, then I was hooked. And so that's, you know, canoe camping, but you bring a tent and then, it, then I just, you know, it just all progresses. Then it's like, well, you know, what are you going to do next? Well, then you go spring, spring trout fishing. Uh, but then you realize, well, I'm, you know, I can camp spring, summer, fall. What about the winter? So I <laughs> figured out a hammocking. I was into hammocking. I still use my hammock. I have a zero degree hammock with, with quilts on the top and bottom. Uh, but, but you want to be, you want to, you don't want to go out there to rough it. You want to go out there to smooth it. So, <laughs> so, so I picked up a, a hot tent, a snow trekker uh, with a stove in it. And I put it on a sled, like a jet sled. Uh, and, and, uh, I, I'll, you know, figure out the access points and you can, you can sled your gear into a camp. Uh, it's all public land. You don't need any permits. You can just park and pull in and, uh, and try to figure out a place where, where maybe I can fish. So, you know, now I figured out a few places where I can go and I can set up and I can catch Northern pike or catch lake trout, um, or landlocked salmon or smelt or perch. So. So these are just these are just fun fun trips and um, you know now with with Instagram and social media I've been able to connect with a few friends who who do similar trips and you know when you get skilled people together you can just go further and further in. No, that's pretty cool. So I mean, were you? I mean, obviously you were bringing food in, or at some point were you trying to like sustain yourself off of what you were catching, or was that too <laughs> risky so far? <laughs> uh, no, you know I. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm I'm enjoying myself. I'm not, you know. I we have, we I always bring plenty of plenty of food. You know, it's it's part of the, especially you know when you're winter camp and it's dark at five o'clock. So yeah, it's nice to throw on a piece of venison backstrap and uh, you know have some Knob Creek and enjoy camp. So I <laughs> can't say that I've you know I've ever uh, ever struggled out there, but um, but certainly you know I 
develop enough skills to have confidence that I know I'm going to catch fish. You know, it may not be the target species, but you can always change your tactics and then catch some perch or smelt or, you know, may, or maybe you go for a walk in the woods. You're looking for snowshoe hare, but you don't see any tracks. So maybe you, you find a pine grove and you take some squirrel instead. So, that so works. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of times it's just a matter of, yeah, just, you know, ha- having the options available to, uh, to just, you know, make, make, make a trip fun to keep it, keep it working. So I got to ask though, because I feel like a naturalist is somebody, especially if you're doing like deer studies or something like that, that there would be at more of an advantage than somebody who wouldn't <laughs> be as far as knowing species of trees, knowing, you know, mass crops, what's happening, uh, what the deer are browsing on. I mean, is that something that's somewhat true or is that kind of false when it comes to uh, deer behavior and patterns? Right. <laughs> you definitely, definitely pay attention. You know, I'm, you know, I'm first and foremost, I'm happy just walking in the woods. So, so, you know, I used to just wander in the woods all the time without a gun in my hand, you know, without a bow, without a fishing pole. I uh, mean, you, you start to, you know, maybe, you know, maybe even not even realizing it, just key in on areas that catch your attention. Um, you know, I, I think, I think, it, you know, any hunter does a little, does a little recon, you can quickly learn some basic sign. Uh, but yeah, I hear you. Maybe identifying beech nuts or hickory groves or you know good acorn drop. Um, um, f- yeah, finding good deer browse. Um, so I, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. It, I'm sure it's. <laughs> I'm sure it has it's helped me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, you know, also it's these are some pretty pressured woods locally. It, so so sometimes you don't you know if you're on public land you don't always have the option to to hunt that funnel or, you know, you get there, but there's already two, three tree stands set up. So sometimes you just, you just get what you get. And then also with the pressure, a lot of guys down where I'm at are, are baiting. So often you're bringing the deer to you. Um, so, so if you're not baiting, you know, the next guy a few hundred yards over might be. And so the deer are just going over there. So, uh, so you guys but, can uh, bait, you can bait on public. You can bait on public, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, that's kind of yeah. a changer because, I mean, I would get mad if I was on public and I was baiting and somebody ended up sitting near my tree stand or on it or something like that. But I'm not going to lie. 90% of the time when I'm out on public ground, especially on Sunday when football's, or football's going on in an afternoon, there is nobody else out there in the woods except for me, maybe one other guy, and we're going opposite directions. And then any of the other time during the week or whatever, when I take off work, there is nobody out there. I am the only person out there or me and my other buddy that I tend to go with. But, and and I find it crazy that, you know, these people, some of the places I go, you can put up a tree stand. Most of them, you can't even put up a tree stand. Like 90% of the properties in Illinois, you can't. And I always just bring one and I set up whatever, but there's been times where, you know, the sun comes up after in the dark and I knew a spot or a general area where I wanted to go. And I will set up a tree stand and I'll look over and about four trees over, there's another tree stand in the woods. And I'm thinking to myself, well, whatever, I'm here, I'm hunting, this guy's not. Right. So <laughs> it'd yeah. be a little bit different in Jersey, I guess. But Yeah, well, it is. A, I, I, I have the same experience, unless it's like opening day or we have six day firearm season where a lot of guys get out. Yeah, unless, unless it's, you know, unless it's specific, exciting day, then the rest of the season, it is pretty wide open and yet. Yeah, you see a lot of empty stands, and you don't even know if they're new or old. So you just gotta, you just gotta go do your thing, and um, you know, and and a lot of them are close, you know, close to the parking lot. So the further away you get, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, but, you know, depending on what you're trying to do, are you trying to fill a freezer, or are you looking for a big buck, or you know, if you're trying to fill a freezer, <laughs> you may not have to go that far. So let's talk about uh, getting a buck. Speaking of that, I mean. Congratulations! Is that your uh, not your first buck, but your biggest, huh? Yeah, yeah, that was my that was my best buck I just got recently. Um, yeah, it was exciting. It was a big, big, big deer. Not not all that far from my home. You know, so, sometimes that's another thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, I could I could drive an hour and find uh, more mature deer. But um, you know, it's it's nice. You know, I'm working full time, so it's nice to just get out when you can. So I, I wasn't having luck at two two spots, two of my two of my spots I've you know I harvest harvest dough from. It wasn't seeing um wasn't seeing any good bucks. So I just just made a new plan and um 
was checking out some new areas and uh, walked in to check a trail cam and I was walking out and I jumped, uh, jumped a buck and it only went about 20 yards and stopped and gave me a shot. So, so that was, uh, that was terrific. And it was nice and early in the permit season. So that means I kind of, you know, now I'm like relax, relaxing for the month because because <laughs> the way Jersey works is you get only so many buck permits. Uh, and this, this permit season, I've taken my buck, so I can't take another and the freezer's full. So now I'm, you know, doing other, doing other things. Right. Now you uh, got just, a chance to waterfall hunt or something. That's my problem. Like I want to be a waterfaller, but it just never lines up because I'm always chasing bucks. I get two of them. So, mm-hmm. you know, if I get one and it's a nice one, I'm always going after that second one. And then, then yeah. next thing I know it's uh, January and then maybe I'll get in like one goose hunt or something like that. And that's, that's pretty much my extent of the waterfowl. So kind of sucks in that aspect, but at the same time, it's pretty cool. So hopefully maybe you get to get out and go do something yeah, like that. I'll, I'll catch a few trout, maybe some landlocked salmon. I haven't got into the waterfowling. I'd love to, but it's almost like there's some things I just want to save for retirement. <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've got too many hobbies and too much gear. And um, um, yeah, water, waterfowling is one of those things I'd like to, you know, I'm sure I'll be into at some point. Same with turkey hunting. You know, I know guys get really into the spring and fall turkey hunting. Uh, I'd love to do some of that, but that's just busy season at work. Uh, but you know, at some point in my life, I'm sure I'll I'm sure I'll jump into that as well. <laughs> yeah. Now the foraging is drying up. You know, there one of the you're asking me about. You know, as a naturalist walking through the woods, if it helps the deer hunting more than anything, it helps the the, the mushroom hunting because uh, you know you might you might go out for deer, but along the way you find some chicken of the woods or hen of the woods or you know, lion's mane or, you know, some autumn, some autumn mushroom flush. Absolutely. So like my biggest thing is one time my buddy and I were out and it actually, I think that's what sparked his fire. And now he's getting into the foraging, mostly mushroom hunting, but, uh, he's really taken off with it. And it's pretty amazing to see how fast he's progressed just because he realized we were out there and I said, man, I don't even care if we get a deer today. We came up and we had a just massive amount of hens i mean they were they were so there were so many and it was crazy as it was november second week of november and we were still hitting hens like crazy and they were fresh and i bet you we took close to maybe 30 to 50 pounds of mushrooms and and i went i was running them back to the truck and he was holding my bow and my pack and everything and and i came back and then afterwards he's like all right what do i do with them after we got back and we didn't get a deer that day and uh he, he comes he's standing at the truck and he's like, well, I'm not going to take them. I don't know what to do with them. So I told him how to clean them and, and some different ways to cook them. And he went home and did it. And he's like, okay, those were really good. Where can we find more of them? So that, I mean, that was pretty cool. And that's what got him hooked. And I love that. That's like one of the best parts about being a hunter, right? You get to spend the time out in nature, but not being a hunter and not a forager, you're almost missing out on some of the nature because there's so much other stuff out there. So yeah, there's, yeah. Yeah, all those plants, all those fung, all the fungus, and it's got a story to tell. And if you don't, if you don't know what you're looking at, you're missing it. So let's talk about that a little bit. Let's roll into that because uh, how did that start for you? And what age was it? Way sooner than the hunting, or what? I, you know, I did go to as a kid. I went to a camp, and there was a little nature shack, and there was a nature counselor, and you know, really a sports camp. And uh, they'd ask you what your hobbies are, and I'd you know I'd always put you like numbered your hobbies, what you want you know what you want to do: soccer, basketball, football, nature. I was probably the only one who you know put number one nature. Um, <laughs> so once a, once a summer they'd have you know they have a or they they'd have a nature program basically that I I could participate in. And there were some hikes as well, but um, there was just a, a cool nature guide uh, who um, really just you know let let us kind of be free in the woods, you know, unstructured play. But uh, I remember clearly learning black birch you know he took his little pocket knife out and carved up some toothpicks out of black birch and mini toothpicks uh dug up some indian um indian cucumber so we got to chew on those roots i uh, learned uh jewel weed so i think it was just those three plants but you know i could clearly tell you where i was standing i remember you know i remember just being interested in it all and uh, just appreciating that that time uh exploring in nature um but the, you know, but then a lot of you know, grade school, middle school, high school. <laughs> it wasn't until I started really working as a naturalist that I really became so interested in plants and then foraging. Um, you know, I, I take a lot. I lead a lot of nature tours, nature walks, and 
you know, sometimes the kids expect to see like charismatic megafauna, you know, big animals out there, but you know, it's not the zoo. They're not in captivity. You know, the kids are making too much noise and we're out there active um, at the times that the animals are often least active. So I ended up making a lot of, a lot of plant stops. So you have the kids scratch and sniff spice bush. So, you know, then I learned more about spice bush and I make tea out of it. Um, so I just start start going around loops through the through the woods and recognizing different plants that I can use as like uh, as like micro lectures to talk about nature to try to engage kids and engage their senses in nature and and just wanting to learn more myself and you know speak from a more authentic perspective I just started to dive in on these different different plant or mushroom species and see how I could use them in my life but you know whether it's food or or medicine or like a tool or something else. So when the kids go on the tours with you, uh, is there anything that they gravitate to or pick up on right away that uh, you wouldn't expect maybe, or they just kind of like, it fascinates them enough to where they gravitate towards that? Well, I think just all kids are like natural, nat are intrinsically into nature. Um, you know, often we have other, other, things that we might enjoy you know maybe they're they're also into football or this and that but you know all kids enjoy exploring nature and seeing what's out there and just realizing that you know all of our backyards have interesting uh diversity of species and, you know i think as a kid i remember learning about the rainforest as if like that was the magical place but the truth is you know all of us have have plant and animal species of interest and you know there were native peoples who lived off of these resources for for thousands of years uh, survived and thrived, so so um, you know they they all just in, enjoy being out there. Uh, but then there there's some kids particularly who who really really thrive on it. You know we we do we do um, after school clubs like Forest Friends Club and Fog Pond Club and camps and the themed camps and um, the, you know they're definitely kids who don't fit into that structure of sports that uh, really really just appreciate being out there exploring the forest and. Uh, think from an early age they're going to have a career in it so i gotta ask you then what's your favorite like uh what's your all-time favorite thing to forage would it be mushrooms or is there some type of plants out there <laughs> uh i like the mushrooms you get such an abundance and it, you know it's like picking the fruit off the off the tree you know it's not damaging a plant you know, I, I appreciate the native plants also for just for just what they are for just their beauty out there so sometimes i'm a little sensitive about picking certain things but the mushrooms uh, is more of an ethical pick. Um, so I'd like to pick a lot of the hen of the woods, particularly uh, a lot of chanterelles, a few morels, uh, you know, a little bit of this and that. Uh, what are other things that I can find? Oyster mushrooms. Um, I cook a lot and freeze it. So, I, you know, I've got a couple, a lot of Ziploc cork bags in my freezer uh, ready to go for, you know, for seasonal meals when, when the mushrooms are not in season. But I also, I also do sell quite a bit of it. I sell to, uh, to a, uh, a vendor who, who sells at farmers markets, so that's just a fun little side hustle during you know before work or lunch break after work. <laughs> uh, so I, I just enjoy, you know it's also it's also the forest gym you know it's, it's exercise. So uh, financially you know wouldn't be the most profitable endeavor, but you know I would be out there anyway. So so I do you know, I do get a lot of pleasure out of that. So what's your favorite to cook then? I mean, is there any particular mushroom? Is it the hen? Probably black trumpets. I've never found a black trumpet. I don't even know if they, I mean, I'm guessing they exist around here in the Midwest, but I've never yeah. seen one even. I see them in, uh, around black birch and sometimes like oaky, oak hillsides that are a little wet. So I've got a lot of that, but I've never, I've never seen any black trumpets. And I mean, I've, I've looked like specifically went out and said, okay, this is what I'm going to look for. I know I'm going to find these other things. And of course you pick them along the way and you get so distracted. You almost forget yeah. you're looking for these black trumpets, but I'm um, so like, we don't, obviously we don't have a whole lot of black birch here in the Midwest. So is that something that would attribute more to the black trumpets than the, I don't know. You know, just in my experience, but it's, you know, it's like when you talk to people about morels, they all have some association, um, you know, and they, often it's different. So it's hard to say. Some of us are just lucky we have more abundant of, you know, of something than somebody else. 
Uh, you know, I think we go on social media and we think it's, we, it kind of makes it seem like it's everywhere, but <laughs> so, so, you know, sometimes you just have more, you know, you have certain, certain pieces of forest where things are going to be abundant and you're just lucky to live where you live and get what you get. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the black I, trumpets I, I, are your favorite to cook though? Yeah. 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 Like and they've got a great flavor. What do they taste like? Jeez, I can't, like can't a black trumpet? <laughs> Is that what? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, way. no way to describe it. It, there, it takes a while to pick them too because they're smaller, you know, sim, you know, similar size to a chanterelle, uh, but not as not nearly as meaty. Um, uh, so you know that's one that I keep for myself. My okay. wife and I like to like to cook those up, and you know, some one of the first things we often do is make make a toasty. You know, put put a little bit on put a cook some in a fry pan and put it on a piece of toast. Put it on put it on pizza because that way you you get the full flavor of it instead of mixing it too deep into a dish. Right. So toasty. I've never heard it called toasty. Is that like a an East Coasty thing or I think that's a Jamie Oliver thing. A Jamie Oliver. Okay. Yeah. That's like the celebrity yeah. chef guy or something. Is that what he is? Or he goes uh, to yeah, your house I, and cooks? I've seen the show, I think, maybe uh, once, but is that the guy that goes uh, to your house? Some, year, years ago he had some maybe he had a yeah, he had a show and a cookbook. Uh and just you know, just one of those guys who slows it down and enjoys the you know, the, the odd odds and ends in the garden or in the field or the forest. Nice. So um, I got to ask you, though, where do, where do you see yourself like kind of gravitating in the future? Any kind of like really cool trips or anything like that you want to do or or deep yeah. adventures or what? Well, I've got a I've got a, a couple trips already lined up for the for the winter and the spring. And I've got my dates already set for uh, for winter camping. So I've got um. Definitely want to focus on catching some big northern pike. Uh, Forty-inch northern pike would be the goal for this winter. They're delicious too. That's a fun fish to eat in the winter to fry up bread and fry up. Um, and then in the spring, I I want to hit some some big brook trout ponds. Carry in a canoe. I've got a Kevlar canoe. Uh, I've got a Hornbeck and a and a Mad River canoe. Uh, both lightweight, so I portage them, carry them on my shoulders, and can get pretty deep and find. Find brook trout and ponds that people aren't may not be getting out to to fish. So there's uh, New York State's got a record brook trout. I think it was 22 inches, about six plus pounds, uh, caught by this guy Rich Buecamp. And so, you know, I read everything I could about him and where he caught it. You know, he claims to catch it at this one pond, but nobody truly knows if it was that pond or, or another pond, because then he ended up weighing it at a place that was farther away than he would have gone if that was the pond that he caught it in. Uh, <laughs> You know, and he was a, you know, he was maybe an older guy, you know, smoked cigarettes, you know, was he really in shape enough to get seven miles out to Silver Lake where he claims he caught it. So, you know, it all kind of creates some fun and, and enthusiasm to go, you know, give it a shot and get out there and, you know, see, see what's biting and see if we can get, get close. Yeah. So, so I got to ask you though, I'm, um, were you ever reading like Thoreau or anything like that, that made you want to kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just, yeah get get away and do these adventures or what you know more like more like uh my side of the mountain and and hatchet yeah you know books for, you know fourth graders fifth graders read um french louis uh, there's a fun book about french louis in the adirondacks um a george washington sears who wrote for field forest and stream um uh, you know, not so much Thoreau. I mean, I'm sure, I've read, I've, I've read Walden, and uh, I've, I've actually visited this summer. Um, but uh, no, it's just just to drive to get out and connect with nature. And you know, when you get away from it all, um, you know, well, I think it is maybe it's a Thoreau quote that um, simplify your surroundings, and the world appears less complicated. I've so, heard that, but I don't know who that is. Yeah. Yeah, so so you just you know you get out there and it's it's just a, a lot of a lot of joy just being out there focused on one thing, you know, put in put in work or you know any other troubles aside. So are you planning on going solo or are you gonna take somebody with you? Yeah, I definitely try to reach out to um, to some you know some skilled people who who um, you know who also have the gear and the desire to to do it. Uh, so I've got a couple couple buddies lined up. Uh, for for some of those trips yeah um but uh but i've really enjoyed also going solo i've done a few solos on the last uh in the last year or two and 
it's um you know it's nice to just go go at your own pace you know i can just get up and go and not have to rely on anybody else not have to wait on anybody else uh, but but some trips you need help you know winter camping you know processing firewood you know, drilling holes <laughs> uh, you know with a hand auger sometimes you know some trips a lot of some trips it's just a lot a lot better having company so how thick of ice is it typically in uh, in your winter trips? Really that varies on the time of the year and the the um <clears throat> the weather conditions that that winter. Um, yeah, you know, low, well, <laughs> but I mean are you like an do, average of 6 inches or is it like no, 2 feet? Yeah, 2 feet, 14 to yeah. Well, 14 to 20 maybe. Yeah, because, I mean, around here, we just don't get that thick of ice unless it's, a, you know, a polar vortex or something. So it always kind of, I always wonder in these different places, like a uh, friend on social media that goes fishing in Utah, and I always wonder how thick the ice is on some of the lakes he's on versus, you know, where we're at. Yeah, you know, you never know till you get there. But um, I watch some of the, there's some uh, trail cameras where you can watch, like we see the snow machines on the ice. So I'll be sitting there in December checking trail cam, checking, uh, not trail cameras, web cameras, you know, waiting for the snow machines to ride on the ice. And then I know, well, if the snow machines are on the ice, I can certainly get out there so I can, you know, I can drive, drive up there and figure it out. Uh, but, but that, uh, you know, that distance sometimes means that I, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to wing it. I want to know. Absolutely. So, yeah. I mean, is there any other things like that? That's a pretty good tip to actually think about is, you know, the snow machines doing that kind of stuff. Is there anything else you've picked up like that? There's uh, there's a NOAA website where you can look at the snow cover. It tells you the snow depth. You know, too too much loose snow, it's just going to be impossible to pull a sled. Um, so so it's nice in the early winter when you have light snow cover and, and hard ice. Um, sometimes later season you get heavy snow thick snow and then you also get slush you get slush layers between the ice i've actually got a friend that uh uses that NOAA layer on google earth for the snow to actually check and see for bear hunting in the spring how far the snow has melted up onto the mountain because yeah. and he'll say okay well if it was here in a week and and now it's here that means there's going to be a nice super green band of grass because the sun's shining and it's been exposed for a week or two. And then he knows to hone in on that elevation to go after the bears because they're going to go there first to the grass and start eating the grass to get rid of their plug in the spring. And and so, cool. so it's pretty cool to see, you know, how different people utilize it for different things and, and uh, tying it all in, you know, it, 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 it's neat to know that, you know, such technologically advanced things are out there for you to rely upon too. Not yeah. that you need, you should rely upon them because you never know one day you might not have them, but um, it definitely right. helps. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's so many different gear choices too. You know, a little change in the weather can completely change your gear choices. So the, as much intel as you can get prior to a trip, it just makes <laughs> everything a bit easier. Um, and there, there's some good outfitters too that'll, you know, that'll give you a little bit of information. Um or, or you, you know, in, again, Instagram, social media, you know, you send a couple private messages around and see what's going on. Um, so even the, even the, the um, well, for New York, the, the Department of Environmental Conservation has got a great website. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of information to gather right online. Um, so I usually write up a whole trip report and I try to gather as much information as I can prior to the trip. Um, put, put it all together you know, with, with maps and notes on distances and uh, you know sometimes i'll do that and then i'll throw it out or i'll never never do the trip because i realize it's not you know it doesn't look like it's worth it um but I, I like to have a few of those set up so i can i can have some options and pick the best option that's pretty cool that actually sounds like the same thing though the same buddy that does the noah layers with that he does it's uh his hunt plan so his entire hunt is planned out with you know contingencies and different different places and routes and things that to prepare and that's pretty neat i've n never fully done that until this year uh for an elk hunt and then i have never ended up actually getting to go on the elk hunt I ended up getting covid instead so my 10 days quarantine was my 10 days that i was going to elk hunt so it did not did not pan out <laughs> so well for me this year 
but ho- hopefully next year is going to be yeah. a year to do something. But yeah, now you, now you have your notes. You can get to it when you get to it. Yeah, yeah. I, it just sucks because I don't know if I'll I'll go back to that area. I was planning on it for that year. Uh, maybe maybe sometime in the future or whatever. But at least I've got it planned out. You know. We'll see what happens with that. So I got to ask you though, how long are these trips? Uh, I mean, are you sledding in a stove with you for like, and then how long are they? Like a week or five days or? Yeah, four or five days usually. Yeah, not not that long. Um, yeah, no, I you know, and I get I get more out of them because because if I'm you know I'm working a full time job, so I can get a, can do extended weekends or take holiday weekends. Uh, in that way, and that sometimes it works well for me because if the weather or something is a bust one weekend or the fish aren't biting, you know, I'll be back in two weeks or so and get after it again. Uh, so usually, usually just a couple days. Have you ever found uh, found the strategy to try and tie work in with that so you could do some type of uh, research or anything? Have you come up with that yet? Well, I, you know what I I've been lucky to do a couple sessions with. Fish and Wildlife Department in New Jersey. So I've taught like the Women in Wildlife uh, Ice Fishing Workshop and taught some family outdoor skills workshops. Uh, and I've certainly taken the skills that I've learned and used them for, for programs like wilderness camps. This Saturday, I'm teaching Castaway to a group of scouts. So we're doing cooking, uh, but without pots and pans. It's fire starting, but without matches. So we'll do flint and steel and magnifiers and lighters and I'll show them fire friction. You use either gonna... white pine white pine or cedar and do a demo for them and let them give it a shot. So so you know it, it does come together and 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 in terms of work, you know, whatever I'm interested in and passionate about, it's more likely people are gonna enjoy the program. So that's kind of compounded and now, you know, I'm kind of known as I had a I had a <laughs> I had a call yesterday, uh girls a girl scout. Troop, they wanted to, wanted to know if I would teach them knife skills. So you know, I kind of get known now as the as the wilderness nature guy, and get to do more of the programs that that I'm personally interested in sharing. So, what kind um, of knife skills? Like nature knife skills, or or are we talking... whittling, okay. potentially whittling. But you know, my my response is really there's so many other skills that I'd rather focus on before <laughs> they ever get to that. You know, I thought it was you know I appreciate the question, but you know, have they ever? Can they set up a tarp shelter? Can they make a fire? Can you know? Can they identify you know a few five local trees? You know, a few wild edibles. There's kind of so many other other fun skills to to focus on before you even get there. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more. I it's kind of intrigued me now about the castaway, and uh, you know, teaching these kids. I understand the fire skills and stuff like that, and doing the friction fire. But okay, let's talk cooking methods. Are we talking like? Splitting the fish open in half, you know, leaving it whole, taking the guts out, putting it over sticks and cooking it over a fire? Or are we talking like packing it in yeah. clay whole and oh. throwing it into a fire and then dragging it out later, cracking the clay off and peeling out, you know, peeling the flesh? Or what are we That's, doing here? That sounds awesome. Um, now, I do have some rainbow trout, so I always keep a couple extra in the freezer so I can use them for programs like this. Um, you know, I do fishing classes. If we catch fish, we can cook a fish. Uh, but, um, but for this, uh, I'm just gonna, um, yeah, it's a good question. I might, maybe we'll wrap it up in some, in some fox scrape leaves or something like that. I'll pro- I might hang it, hang it over the fire with some string, some cordage and, um, and smoke it. Um, yeah, I'll probably, uh, might, might even just put it up on a slab of rock. I don't know. Maybe I'll leave it up to them for that one. Um, but but um, I, I'll have a piece of venison. I have some venison. We'll we'll put that right on the coals and do do that to um, do a cook it right on the coals that way and char it up. That comes out nice. Um, they're but they're going to do you know these are these are kids. They're going to do um, tin foil. They're going to make like uh, banana boats. Like cut open a cut open a banana and put chocolate in it. <laughs> we'll make cinnamon cinnamon apples. We'll cut up apples and put cinnamon and wrap it up in tin foil, so it's like the inside of an apple pie. Yeah, um, we'll go we'll go through gear. You know, I'll show them a huge backpack and how you, know, you can be like an astronaut and bring everything with you, uh, or you learn a few skills and you can reduce the load. That was uh, George Washington Sears said that right, or Nesmuk. 
was the one who was saying oh, yeah. you learn a few skills and you'll you'll need less tools because he was yeah. talking about you know but the one thing he would sacrifice i believe was a cast iron skillet he would always bring that with him no matter what no matter the weight yeah um but yeah, yeah. i remember in the, in the nest Muck book his companions leave it out and and so he teaches them a lesson by putting some bugs in it so they know better than to like leave it out and dirty in camp <laughs> but uh they, you know one of the things i'll have the kids do is i'll have them i use a stick stove and they have to race to boil water to make hot chocolate so you know they'll be motivated to have hot chocolate uh, so and that way they'll learn they'll learn different methods to to treat water because that's another part of that badge so uh stick stove when you're talking stick stove are you talking like make a stove out of sticks or are you talking like a like a jet stove like a rocket stove uh, like in this case it's just um just like a, I, it's from ikea it's like a canister you put your kitchen utensils in or your you know pencil can it's got holes in it so they'll just feed sticks into it and i've got some metal stakes you can use like 10 stakes through the top to hold your pot so it doesn't fall in so it's just an, an open it's really a can with lots of holes in it so you put your sticks in there and it gets plenty of oxygen so as long as they can find and snap good dry twigs they'll be able to get a get a good roaring fire going and boil some water nice nice yeah so like the first time i ever heard about the wrapping the fish in clay like rolling them in yeah. clay packing them in clay and throwing them in the fire it was my grandfather was telling me when he was a young boy he had he had two older brothers that were quite a bit older than him and he went to south dakota and i don't know if I don't know the whole history or whatever, but somehow he went up there and they visited either other family or he went to visit his brothers. And when they were up there, they went fishing and he's like, well, how are we going to cook these fish as a little kid? And they're like, what do you mean? How are we going to cook them? And they took some clay from the bank. They were right where they caught them and wrapped them in them and had a campfire and threw them right in there. And they took a stick and slid them out after the clay was all dry and slightly cracked. And he said, you wait That's until the clay that. cracked and then you crack it open and eat it. So. Yeah, I like that. I did. Um, I did fennel the other day. I wrapped a trout in fennel. Um, it was at a squirrel fest. I had it with some buddies. We, it's a couple chefs and a couple hunters, foragers. And I wrapped one up in fennel and it came out, came out perfectly well. Uh, you know, especially on a trout, you get a little bit of charred edge and that just tastes delicious. You know, when you get that like potato chip fin. Yeah. So what's uh, your favorite way to cook a squirrel then? I got to ask that because there's so many different things to do to a squirrel that I like to uh, boil them for for a bit, to soften them up, and then put them on a grill. And just straight up grill them, or what do you? Nothing on them? Yeah. Olive oil, butter, what? Oh sure. What? Yeah, sure. A little Montreal or adobo. Yeah, that's usually what I have in my kit. <laughs> so, you're, are you talking? You're talking when you're out in the wilderness. This is what you do to a squirrel. Or is well, they it... sure taste better out there. But I, you know, <laughs> yeah. I brought brought a brought a few home and so you know sometimes you put them in the crock pot then and have some fun that way make some squirrel wings but uh yeah let them, let them go let them let them cook a while and they tender up nice yeah i've never eaten well i shouldn't say that i've eaten one over a fire in the wild and it was uh it was a little tough it was definitely yeah. a little tough and it wasn't enjoyable the only thing that made it enjoyable is being out out where i was and doing it but other than that, it wasn't that enjoyable. I mean, there's plenty of other things I would have rather killed if they were in season to uh, to eat for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, sometimes you, well, you put it, you can put it in a pot and braise it, and pour pour a beer in there, and put some wild mushrooms in there, and let it go a long time, and then the meat will peel right off. That's not a bad idea. Maybe I'll have to try that. I'll have to try and do an extended trip or something and uh, sustain myself on on game. Yeah, yeah, a little more civilized, maybe that way. <laughs> yeah but um it's it's been good uh talking to you i'm sure there's a lot of other things we could talk about but uh probably right now is a good time to wrap it up and keep keep it at uh at the allotted time limit here so um if people are interested and want to see more of your content or maybe contact you and learn some things along the way how can they do that nature into action I've got an Instagram account and a YouTube account and a website, and they're all nature into action. No, it's been cool, man. I appreciate you coming on, David, and uh, talking to us. And, and uh, good luck with your classes this weekend and uh, teaching the youth because that's important, as we know. Uh, mentorship is, is very important. 
Appreciate it. Thank you, Luke. Yep. It was good talking with you. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenge.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. Thank you.